the Paul Leslie interviews. Ladies and gentlemen, it is our great pleasure to welcome our special guest, Lorcan Otway. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. I want you to take us back a little bit. Where are you from, and what was life like growing up? Oh, well, I suppose the place to start is when I'm nine. We had a, before that, we had a small subsistence farm where we, where my dad was able to write as a novelist and uh, be able to afford to eat. But in, in 1964, we bought what became Theater 80. It was Scheib's place. It's an old speakeasy turned jazz club on the Lower East Side in Manhattan. And it was very different New York, very different world. There was still the reverberations of prohibition. Basically, it was still a, a New York of small shops and family businesses. You couldn't get elected to office unless you were in bed with organized crime. And yet there was a tremendous amount of support as a result for small business. And it, it was a uh, greatly diverse community. Tell us a little bit more about the community. St. Mark's Place was in a uh, Ukrainian and Polish neighborhood, an Italian neighborhood, there was the, the block itself was the end we lived on was predominantly Irish and, and Italian. Then in the middle of the block, you had a building, which is for the most part Puerto Rican. And then up the block, you had the Poles and Ukrainians living and they formed two very different communities. And then, so it was a, there was still a, a ethnically de defined and divided community, but the uh, it was also um, the end of the Jazz Age. It was before St. Mark's Place became the Haight-Ashbury of, of New York, and so it was before the the Summer of Love. And what it was also, um, we had kind of fallen into real decrepitude on St. Mark's. Uh, there wasn't a tree from Avenue A to Third Avenue, the three blocks that make up St. Mark's. And my memories of summers were that kind of sparkly light of the broken glass bottles that you would have seen if you walked down the Bowery, which the Bowery began just a few blocks from us, and we were kind of an extension of, of Skid Row. Then my father began going door to door explaining John Lindsay's program of planting trees on St. Mark's, and it's now a uh, tree-lined avenue, and it was the epicenter of downtown theater shortly after Dad built Theater 80. We were really the magnet business that got things started here again. Up the block from us, the Orpheum reopened, and then the St. Mark's Cinema, and upstairs from them, the uh, Negro Ensemble Company was formed. Many of those theaters that grew up during that period are now gone. We've lost uh, at least a dozen theaters within a five-block walk from where we are today. Wow. What year was the building there at 80 St. Mark's? What was the year that it was uh, built? There are portions that are from the wilderness period of the early Dutch settlement. We're built on top of a stone structure that the Dutch built, and you can still see under our foundations rooms that from the, the Dutch house, which is built with round river rock, as it was before farming had broken ground to bring up flat field stone. And then in 1830, the present structure was built. And so the, the majority of the building is, is 1830. And then in the 20th string prohibition, with help from the city council behind the scenes, a Bavarian gangster named Frank Hoffman joined 78 and 80 to these two 1830s uh, tenements and secretly built a, a jazz club building out into the backyard. So the auditorium of the theater was the dance floor of the speakeasy. And in fact, you could still see the our back wall, the door to the alleyway, which was the only way in. And on the front wall, on the inside of the building, you see the iron fittings that held steel plates over the windows. So the, uh, the building was fortified, so you actually couldn't get into the lower building from St. Mark's Place. You had to go around the corner and come in from First Avenue. Often removed the, uh, the internal stairs. Built a um, large Cuban mahogany circular bar. We have half of that left. In fact, our tap room of our tavern is half of the original tap room from the speakeasy. And, of course, Cuban mahogany now is, is highly prized there. Uh, the trees are almost extinct and, uh, and protected. There's only a handful of Cuban mahogany trees left. There have no doubt been some very historically significant people who have gone through those doors or who have been performers there. Can oh, yeah. you tell us about some of them? Sure, the famous and the infamous. I suppose 
starting from the earliest to the to the immediate present during prohibition uh, the city council used to uh, drink here so al capone would visit and in fact the capone family still visit every once in a while and right after prohibition frank sinatra in 1939 this is one of the places that he worked as a sing waiter. Then when the California jazz and bebop movement began, Thelonious Monk played here all the time. John Coltrane recorded live at the Jazz Gallery here. Lord Buckley, Richard Buckley, the uh, jazz age comedian who uh, became a hipologist, uh, who Robin Williams credits for as being the founder of his style of comedy, he had his cabaret card taken here in 1960, and which led to his untimely death. His family believed that he was beaten to death by the uh, police at the precinct when he went to demand his cabaret card back. But that began the free speech movement. So uh, Lord Buckley's performance was, was very, very important here. And then uh, on our watch, uh, when You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown opened here in 1967, launched the careers of Bob Balaban and Gary Berghoff, as well as one of our ushers, Billy Crystal, then uh, during the years we showed classic film here, we were visited by Joan Crawford, who gave my father the painting from uh, Whatever Happened to Baby Jane, which fortunately my mother sold when my father died, but the fellow who uh, owns it very kindly has lent it to us for a while, so it's on display in the theater. But during that period, we started the Sidewalk of the Stars, so we have the signatures of about 30 major stars from uh, Myrna Loy, John Crawford, Gloria Swanson, Ruby Keeler, and Joan Blondell. Alan Cummings signed recently. Joan Rivers signed the sidewalk. And quite a few others. It's an ongoing project. But Ethel Merman would come to the theater. Greta Garbo would come in disguise to the theater. Then uh, in recent times, the, um, Sir Patrick Stewart has played here. Uh, the, uh, we had a wonderful visit by... Uh, James Earl Jones, who my father had worked with many, many years ago in, in the 60s. Billy Connolly was here recently. It's just, so it's kind of a, uh, it's a very, very special community around, around Theater 80. And of course, Arlene Dahl visited. She was one of the presenters when Alan Cummings signed the Sidewalk. I know your audience has recently had a delightful uh, chat with Arlene Dahl. Indeed. <laughs> Going on about the Walk of Fame there, is there anyone that you especially would like to see be oh, yes. <laughs> I think there's a, there's a real short list of um, one of the people who I would love to sign the sidewalk is, and we have, we have a number of people who have said yes and we to make sure that there's never any embarrassment. We don't announce who they are until the end so they, they're, they're scheduled to go. But one of the people that if anyone listening has a good pipeline to, I would love Robert De Niro to uh, sign our sidewalk. Um, so my, fondest teenage, young teenage memories is my father produced a play written by Shelley Winters called One Night Stands for Noisy Passenger, which was the first time that Robert De Niro got nationwide credits, reviews, got excellent reviews for the play. And it closed because of the 1974 off-Broadway theater strike. But he's done so much for theater in New York City that it would really, uh, having him sign the sidewalk would be... Uh, very, very meaningful to me. It's very interesting that in this one building, it's it's more than just a theater. Oh, yes. Tell us about the Museum of the American Gangster. It's an interesting project. In 1964, my father and I found $2 million in the basement. When he found two hidden safes, he called Walter Scheib, who had been the front man for the gang that ran the speakeasy during Prohibition. And the way he uh, put it, he said... Walter, I'm too curious to leave the safe closed, but too cautious to open it without you here. We opened the first safe. It was absolute Geraldo Rivera moment. It was completely empty. So we tilted the other safe open and cut a small hole in the bottom, and we found $2 million in, in gold certificates. And Mr. Scheib um, used those in 1967 to build the Promenade Hotel in Miami. And the story would have ended in 67, except in 2009, I discovered that the materials that were associated with that money were still in that safe. The remains of three people's dinner, a photograph of a uh, cabaret singer named Hugh Ortega, links which led me to discover the head of the, the gang that ran the speakeasy, Frank Hoffman, who was a Bavarian gangster during Prohibition. 
And it's led to my writing a book, which I'm in the process of completing now, called The Girl in the Safe, which is the story of the speakeasy here and how my father was sold the building as a as a patsy to uh, so that Mr. Scheib could open the safe and have someone to blame if things went badly. So uh, one, it's, it's, it's a great privilege to be kind of in a curatorial position over the building, but the uh, museum came out of a of a project to share that story with the, the general public, and um, I, I was kind of in a unique position to run the museum and form the museum in that. I had a law degree in practice law and degree in uh, political science, and also I uh, grew up Quaker. And very often in the years that I dressed plain, I was a plain dressing Quaker, it looked relatively Amish. People would always, you know, make comments to me about that they uh, that they didn't believe in organized religion, and I would always say, well, no, I, I, I'm not a member of an organized religion. I'm a Quaker. We're much more an example of organized crime than organized religion. We have no organized theology. We are very disorganized in our work life. The only thing we bind together to do well in every generation is break the law, from the Underground Railroad to the Sanctuary Movement to the uh, medical supplies sent to North Vietnam and the uh, pipeline for uh, draft resistors going to uh, Canada. We have always organized very well to break the law, so I've always considered my religious life to be an example of organized crime, and we, in fact, use that in the the museum in contextualizing the story of how in America we're trapped between two concepts which define us, moral certainty and liberty. Whoever comes to power outlaws what the other half does, and those who've been injured, whose bull has been gored by that, respond with outraged liberty, and instead of um, pluralism being the pressure valve, usually it's the fact that large numbers of Americans group together to break the law that provides the, the valve that keeps us from outright uprisings, uh, generally. And so uh, that's kind of the origin of the museum. But we have the bullets from the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. We have uh, a number of really extraordinary uh, pieces help to describe and contextualize the story of organized crime in America. Very interesting. In addition to the Museum of the American Gangster, there's also the William Barnacle Tavern. Yes, that's the that's again it's the it's half of the original tap room from the speakeasy. Being that I, I spent I spent a lot of time in Ireland. Uh, my wife and I built boats from the west of Ireland and uh, covered the war in the north of Ireland as a photojournalist in the mid seventies and it's a um then my family is, is Anglo Irish on the father's side and there's a it's one of the only truly oh non self conscious Irish pubs in New York. Uh, you know, no plastic patties or, uh, you know, shamrocks behind the, uh, the bar. We have uh, great Irish music on Monday nights, great Kaylee band that plays here. And we serve 20-some-odd varieties of absinthe. We have great single malt scotches from Isla. And we also feature real ciders that are not the, um, you know, the, we have an on-tap cider, but it's, which is the, those ciders are basically uh, apple juice and grain alcohol, but we have fermented ciders from Brittany, from northern Spain, from Ireland. What in England they refer to as crumpy, in other words, the, the, the real thing, fermented apple. What kind of crowd would you say goes to the tavern? Oh, we have we have a kind of a uniquely old-time New York crowd in that. One of the things that I think has been the, um, the outcome of the present trend in America to destroy the middle class, to shove the middle class into poverty and to jail the poor, you know, 2.3 million people in jail. It's been a loss of diversity in, in neighborhoods as small shops are replaced by the uh, chain stores. But if you come to uh, William Barnacle Tavern, you find the uh, old families from the neighborhood sitting next to the um, you know, 1970s and 90s anarchist crowd from Tompkins Square Park dowagers from Park Avenue finding a shared culture and truly unique, uniquely New York experience. There's that wonderful uh, quote from Chris Hutchins that as one of the effects of modernity is that more and more every place is beginning to become the same and when everything has become the same we'll have lost something very valuable but even worse we'll have lost the way to describe what we've lost. The tavern really is a um, example of one of the 
the holdouts of the old diverse culture of New York. What is in the future for Theater 80? Well, that's that's a good question. You know, we've been here for 51 years. My greatest hope is to uh, do as my father did and die in the traces, you know, and continue this, you know, into the future as, as an icon in New York. But that becomes increasingly difficult. Under Mayor Bloomberg, our taxes were tripled, our, our property taxes. And New York is one of the, not one of the only, it's the only city I've ever been in where the Council on the Arts excludes commercial theater in its mandate, that the future is a struggle. We've started a, a number of projects to try and keep theater radio uh, alive and viable, and uh, we've been growing at a rate, a uh, financial rate of 670% since the first week of the recession, and yet the expense of running small business in New York has grown faster. As my father used to say and smile, I have him on film saying that you know, sponsorship is always nice, but commercial theater has to remain commercially viable to be truly independent. One of the great examples I often use to describe the importance of commercial theater is Hair, which has become you know, seen as an icon of, of American theater and change. And yet, when it started in the public theater in a uh, not-for-profit, it was a fairly run-of-the-mill boring show when... It went to a commercial house under Tom O'Horrigan is when they challenged the laws on uh, the moving nude on stage at the revolutionized theater. And that commercial theater has the freedom and the courage to do things that are impossible for -for not-for-profits to do. Is there anything coming up in the future at Theater 80 that people in New York who are either live there or are traveling there can look forward to? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, we have a number of ongoing shows that are always fun. We have Improvised Shakespeare comes regularly, the Improvised Shakespeare Company from Chicago, who are brilliant. But one of the events that is going to be kind of in the in the, the tradition of what happens here, we're, um, we're doing a sidewalk signing with a number of people. The most recent that's absolutely in the works and we're, we're, we're scheduling, we're doing the 50th anniversary of Get Smart, and Barbara Feldon is going to sign the sidewalk and... As part of the night, we're also having Joe Sirola, who many people remember as being the one-eyed bandit who gets shot by Clint Eastwood for hanging him in Hanging High. He's one of the kind of iconic actors from that, but it's, it's great credits. And he uh, played one of the bad guys in Golden Finger, I think was the name of the episode. And so that's going to be kind of a uh, wonderful night to remember and honor Barbara Feldon, who along with Diana Rigg was one of the first of that kind of outgoingly strong women in television, the idea of a uh, woman secret agent, you know, uh, uh, and and very kind of the American comedy version of Diana Rigg. What is the best thing about being Lorcan Otway? Oh, (laughs) well, it's a little bit like the the old idea of (laughs) interesting times. I refer to theater radio as my beloved burden. Without a doubt, it is having the honor and the privilege of day-to-day struggling to keep theater AD alive. It's one of those things where it's put me in the hospital on a number of occasions, but uh, I wouldn't trade it for the world. The last question I have Mm -hmm. is kind of open-ended. For anyone who's listening to this, wherever they are, what would you say to them? It's so important today to return to America of small businesses that the cornerstone of our freedom, our freedom of expression, our freedom to be who we are, is to resist the fact that the trend in America has been away from small business and the disempowerment of the majority of Americans who are the small business class, those who work for, work in, and own small businesses, and that for us to have the kind of theater that we had during the last years of the 60s, which were you know, the most exciting season of theater I can remember was from 67 till you know, the early 70s, we really have to take back our democracy and, and replace all the fighting and the infighting with this, with this concept of pluralism and pull together. As Daniel Webster said, you know, either pull together or hang alone. And I think that has to be the, me- the message for the majority of Americans to together. We have to, we have to go back to pulling together. I actually lied. I have one more question. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> I'm all yours. <laughs> Who is Lorcan Otway? Oh, goodness, That's isn't that a question? <laughs> the New York Times asked me that, and I said I'm either a, 
a poster child for ADHD or, uh, as they described me, a uh, courtly polymath. I think the jury's still out on that. <laughs> you said a courtly polymath. And master of many trades, as uh, well, oh, described by a, a New York Times uh, journalist, a gentleman named Berger, a delightful fellow. I was always amused by that. I actually, as a joke, put it on my business card for a while. <laughs> That's not uh, bad. A uh, person of wide-ranging knowledge or learning. <laughs> well, there you are. I suppose that the, the key is that I grew up at a time when you actually went out and discovered your interests in the real world rather than on computer. You know, I had an interest in Irish balladry that was grown up in a family collecting Irish ballads. And so I went and I, uh, you know, spent years walking down country lanes, seeking out singing families in Ireland, went to see on square riggers and schooners. And that was the real strong basis of my education. And then I took all that I learned there and went to law school. I went to NYU law school in the 90s. I think it's getting harder and harder to do that with the closing for the margins where um, people are becoming almost homebound by their computers. What would be your favorite Irish ballad? Oh, <laughs> I would. It's like my love of Scotch whiskey. It's, it's always embarrassing to say my favorite Irish ballad is from Scotland. <laughs> the long form ballads in, in Scotland have great tradition. But I suppose with an Irish balladry, Turlock Ogle Boyle, it's a Romeo and Juliet story from a place in Donegal, and my wife and I actually were up in Bo uh, Donegal collecting information on the boats I built, and we came across Doe Castle, which features prominently in this in this story, and we actually were able to get up into the walls of the castle but by borrowing a ladder and found the room where the action of the ballad takes place. And the old Norman castles had double walls, and so even though the all the wood was gone, you could go up through the walls and find the window of the room where it all happened. And I sat on the window ledge and sang this 40-verse ballad about the uh, this murder and suicide. And it just to actually see the topography that's that's described in the song, it was this is magic. <laughs> Will you sing a line from it for us? Oh, certainly. Let me think. God, it's early in the day to sing. Wild are thy hills, O Donegal, that frown and darkly rise, as if to greet the mist that falls upon them from the skies. Dark, dark thy hills, and darker still thy mountain torrents flow, but none so dark as Madame Weirin's heart and his castle hall that do. There you go. <laughs> <Shanae>. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, my great pleasure. It's been great to connect with you. I hope to one day be standing inside Theater 80. Yeah, I can't wait for the day. I hope you uh, come on one of the days that we have one of our great events like a sidewalk signing. Thank you so much, Paul. I, I enjoyed speaking with you. I enjoyed talking to you. Godspeed. You too.